जय हिंद 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 आई एम ओवर जॉय टू सी दैट यू हैव ऑलरेडी रियलाइज दैट द रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी ऑफ विनिंग फ्रीडम does not rest merely on the shoulders of our countrymen at home it is but natural that they should bear the brunt of the burden and they have been doing so already but at the same time every indian no matter where he may be living at the present time has a duty towards this country and he must contribute his due share towards the final victory <laughs> On 2nd July 1943 a man arrived in Singapore He was warmly received by Rash Bihari Bose president of the Indian Independence League and other members those who were on hand to greet this man a great destiny was shaping itself this distinguished guest had brought with him the blessings of their homeland in the great struggle to be launched against britain for indian independence rash bihari bose declared and to you all here that we meet today soon so soon after our last conference in shona but events are not in past these days and our movement for the sacred cause of mother india has made enormous strides in the two months since our conference at the end of april Today we are on the eve of the most vital, the most decisive phase of our fight for the freedom of our motherland, and I am confident that we are on the threshold of victory. When when I left Pune for Tokyo towards the end of May, I told you that I would be back in about six weeks, and I am here now. Friends and family, now. 
You may ask me what I did in Tokyo for our cause. What present I have brought for you? Well, I have brought for you this present. This man was Subhash Chandra Bose. The 51st Congress at Haripura was Bose's political coronation. The moment meant much to him. He did justice to it in an immense speech ranging over the whole field of Congress policy from the national and international points of view. To millions of Indians, he was a leader who had vowed to free India from foreign yoke. He had also proclaimed the ideals of a future socialism that would deliver the country from poverty and inequality. He roused the nation with his patriotic vision and his stirring call found a ready echo in the hearts of his people. Our struggle is no doubt a non-violent struggle, but even a non-violent struggle demands an army, an organization, and a machinery. India is going to be free, and that we who live today are going to play a part in making India free. There is no power on earth that can keep India enslaved anymore. Let us strive for India's freedom one day, Master. To him, at this moment, Gandhi was a revered Mahatma and the architect of Indian independence. In 1939, Bose sought election as Congress president at Tripuri, was successful and entered his second year of office. But he had come to the parting of ways. Differences with Mahatma Gandhi were becoming too severe for him to retain his office. For there was no compromise in Bose's makeup, no middle way, no shades between light and dark. He was essentially a man of action and wanted to force the issue of Indian independence with the British at once. Such a man was born on the morning of 23rd January, 1897. Subhash, the child of Janaki Nath and Prabhavati, was influenced by Swami Vivekananda's creed of service to humanity and particularly to Mother India. In his boyhood, he was taught by Beni Madhav Das, the great teacher who instilled in his eager pupil the virtues of honesty and steadfastness to one's duty. Subhash was an avid reader, introspective, his mind turning in upon itself in a precocious concern for religious truth self-control and psychic harmony. But philosophy was not his congenial study. Though he was attracted to yoga and mysticism, there was in him a quick compassion for suffering humanity and the conflict between mystic and man of action thus came early to him. Professor Samar Guha comments. Netaji is the Falja demanded. Netaji is the image of the aspiration of free India. Netaji has been acclaimed by the Indian people as the greatest revolutionary, as the epical hero of our freedom struggle. But he is more than that. In his inner self, he describes himself not as a politician, not as a revolutionary, but as an Indian pilgrim who merged his whole identity in the mission of India, which he all along his life believed that India has a mission to fulfill, not for herself alone, but for the greater world community. India lived 
the centuries of life and carried a cultural heritage of our own which reflects in our philosophy of synthesis. Synthesis of spiritual and material values. Persuaded by his elders to sit for the ICS examinations, he went to England and was successful. But he resigned from the ICS on the 22nd of April 1921 to leap into the boiling cauldron of freedom struggle. Characteristically, he explained his move. National and spiritual aspirations are not compatible with obedience to civil service conditions. In 1921, Subhash Bose went to Bombay and plunged into political work after a meeting with Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi said, Subhash preferred selfless service to selfish ambition. His political guru was Deshabandhu Chitaranjan Das. In April 1924, Subhash Bose became the chief executive officer of the Calcutta Corporation. At about this time, the political situation in India became worse. The Indian determination to do without the British met with stiffer resistance from the imperial masters. Not only did the British deny that they would leave India in the foreseeable future, their conduct gave no hint of withdrawal. The British believed in treating Indian nationalism with a firm hand. This was the atmosphere of Subhash Bose's entry into Indian politics in 1921. His appeal to the youth of the land was enormous. It was from the ranks of the young that he recruited more visionaries and patriots to forge the strong links of national independence. In 1924, he was arrested as one of the suspected terrorist leaders and in 1925, was transferred to the fort of Mandalay in Burma. In June, he mourned the sudden death of C.R. Das. This was a cataclysmic loss to Bose, as never before he was on his own. After serving as the GOC of the Congress, of which Muthilal Nehru was the president, he became the mayor of the Calcutta Corporation. He said, civic progress all over the world is moving in the direction of municipal socialism. The real school of democracy is local self-government. In 1932, he was exiled to Europe. He went to Vienna for the medical treatment recommended by his doctors. There, both met Mr. Vitalvai Patel, a great congressman and patriot. At the end of 1934, Bose flew to India to see his ailing father, but reached home too late to see him alive. And he sailed again to Europe on January 10th, 1935. During this year, his health was generally restored, and by its end, the urge to re-enter the struggle in India was irresistible. Bose returned as Congress president in 1938. At the age of 41, he became the president of the Congress and his reputation as a political leader was second to none. Subhash Bose realized the necessity of Congress unity, but at the same time, he meant to mold its policy if he could. He was a rebel president of the Indian National Congress but by April 1939, he had come to the parting of ways. Rabindranath Tagore, the national poet, conferred on him the title of Desha Nayak, or savior of the land. Meanwhile, war clouds had gathered over Europe, and Britain was involved in a titanic struggle for the might of the German Empire. Bose applied Tillich's formula and said, that Britain's difficulty was India's opportunity. On July 2nd, 1940, Netaji was arrested and sent to the presidency jail. But he had to get out of prison. He announced he would starve himself to death. He declared, release me or I shall refuse to live.
so daring a protest could hardly fail. Bose was allowed to go home, where he planned his great escape from India. In the early hours of 17th January, 1941, a car drew up before his residence and accompanied by his nephew, Sisir, he escaped. Sisir Bose, who drove Bose up to Gomo, explains the escape route taken by his uncle to the then agent of the Special India Division of the German government, Dr. Alexander Wirth. His arrival in Berlin had been prepared, prepared by the uh, Foreign Office in connection with uh, the Foreign Office in Rome and the Foreign Office in Moscow. When he had uh, contacted the Italian first and the German uh, embassy as the second in Kabul, uh, they, these two, uh, they were legations in those days. Um, they were in touch with headquarters in Berlin and uh, these headquarters, uh, namely the Foreign Office, through the Chancellery, went in touch with Rome and Moscow at once to see and to find out whether Boas uh, camouflaged as an employee of the Italian legation in Kabul would and could um, travel sort of officially and openly but camouflaged as his Excellency, he was called later on, first as Mr. Orlando Mazotta, employee of the Italian legation in Kabul, as such, with the passport of the Italian embassy, supported and signed by the authority of the Italian Foreign Office, from Kabul to Moscow, and fly from there again as Miss as Signore Orlando Mazotta from Moscow to from Moscow to Berlin. Netaji reached Berlin and addressed the Indian Independence Meeting in German. Um ihren unsterblichen Glauben an die Freiheit und ihren unerschütterlichen Entschluss, den Kampf bis zum Siege weiterzuführen, zu bekräftigen. In diesem Kampf, der für Indien ein Kampf um Sein oder Nichtsein ist, kann es nur einen Ausgang geben unseren gemeinsamen Sinn. Lang leben die drei Fachmächte und ihre Verbündeten. Lang lebe das freie Indien. Rose raised an Indian legion of three infantry battalions and a company of regulars which would be trained to fight the British. He recruited many of the prisoners who received his proposals eagerly, for they were all imbued with the same thought, freedom for India from the British yoke. He hoped that when the time came for Indian liberation, his legion would spearhead the struggle. why Netaji chose to go to Berlin. Mr. Asian Nambia, Bose's ex-colleague, answers. Because Germany was the principal country fighting Britain. Is it? 
uh, his attitude towards uh, Hitler government? He was critical of Hitler government, but he did not worry very much about the ideological side of Hitler government. He was only thinking Hitler, or the National Socialist government, the German government, in terms of one opposing Britain. And uh, it's very likely and even probable, as uh, his good friend Lothar Frank told me once, and he stated in his book of Dr. Wirth, that if Soviet Union had been fighting Britain, he might have, instead of coming to Berlin, gone to Moscow. Bose's idea in organizing the INA in Europe is explained by another ex-colleague of Netaji, Dr. J.K. Banerjee. Europe in war, here you have the clue why INA was organized in Europe. Simply put, the plan was to obtain military aid from the enemies of our enemy for putting an end to British rule in India. I would prefer, however, to let Netaji himself speak as to how he saw the role of the INA. Netaji never thought of the INA as a purely military instrument capable of liquidating all by itself the securely entrenched British Raj. Netaji saw the INA in its historical context as an integral part of the final episode in the unfolding drama of India's long struggle for freedom. INA was to be a catalyst, turning the freedom movement within India into an irresistible wave, sweeping away the political, economic, and social underpinnings of Britain's Indian establishment. Mr. Nambia, he met the Führer only once. Only once, yes. What was the purpose? He wanted Hitler to give a, a declaration favoring Indian independence. Hitler observed great reserve to it, saying that um, it was, time was not at opportune because he could not carry it out, his promises. His forces were still very remote from the Indian frontier. Then both said that um, both always was aware that Hitler had reserved the Indian independence movement. And he had made reference to it in his book, Mein Kampf, with some contentious references to India. Bose wanted these to be removed in an, another edition or a new edition. Hitler didn't give a promise, but said that he would give the matter his attention. Then Hitler explained about his uh, the diffidence that he had about India achieving independence and made certain suggestions, which irritated Bose, and Bose said to the translator, you see, please tell His Excellency that I have sufficient experience of politics not to need his suggestions. The translator was half from thought, a very distinguished German who was hanged in German. He politely toned down the little in diplomatic language. On the whole, the, 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 the meeting was not a very happy one. Back in India, Mahatma Gandhi frustrated the Crips mission and announced the Quit India movement. Thus, preparations were afoot to harden resistance to the British government. In Germany, Subhash Bose urged his fellow countrymen to support the mass movement launched by Mahatma Gandhi. From Germany, Subhash Bose decided to go to the Far East. He was disillusioned about the promised German aid to his enterprise. Hitler's attack on the Soviet Union upset him. Nothing more was to be gained by remaining in Berlin. Therefore, he left Germany in a submarine. And surfaced in Tokyo sometime later to assume leadership in the Far East. In your presence today, I design my office and appoint this to our first of the vote as President of the Indian Independence League.
श्री राज बिहारी जी बोस पूर्वी एशिया की जंग आजादी की नुमाइंदो बहनों और भाइयों सबसे पहले मैं आप लोगों के दीदी इस इस्तेबाल के लिए और साथ ही साथ आपने जो मुझको पूर्वी एशिया की जंग आजादी के नेता बनाया इसके लिए भी तय दिल से आप लोगों का शुक्रिया अदा करता हूं क्योंकि अब ये वक्त नहायत नाजुक है मैं इस जिम्मेदारी को कबूल करता हूं लेकिन नहायत नम्रता के साथ और खुदा से दुआ मांगता हूं कि उन्होंने हमें वो ताकत वो जोश और वो बहादुरी दें जिससे हम अपने हम वतनों की पूरी पूरी मर्जी के मुताबिक लड़ाई लड़े और हिंदुस्तान को आजादी पहुंचा देर इज नो पावर दैट कैन कीप इंडिया इन प्लेज एनी मोर देट एस ट्राइव फॉर इंडिया फ्रीडम वन डे मार्च इसलिए ये काम अगर करना है इस प्रोविजनल गवर्नमेंट जब इंडिया कायम करना है तो हिंदुस्तान के बाहर हो सकता है अंदर नहीं हो सकता और अब देखेंगे कि दुनिया की तारीख में भी ये नई बात नहीं है दूसरे इनकलाब ने इस जंग में देखो स्वैस ने क्या किया था उन्होंने पैरिस और लंदन में जाकर पहले मरतबा उन्हें जो प्रोविजनल गवर्नमेंट वह कायम किया और इसका सौ सौ मैं इस साल में देख सकता हूं इस तारीख की कुछ नई चीज नहीं है लेकिन हिंदुस्तान की तारीख में एक नई बात है और हमारे हम दोनों को बताए जाएंगे कि यह काम तुम्हारे लिए करना है लेकिन क्योंकि अंदरूनी हार देती है तो नहीं कर सकते हमें करना है लेकिन इस आर्य हुकूमत का मकसद क्या होगा सिर्फ लड़ना और हिंदुस्तान को फायदा करना हमारे सामने एक ही प्रोग्राम रहेगा फाइटिंग प्रोग्राम लड़ाई का इंतजाम करना लड़ाई शुरू कर देना और कामयाब करना लड़ाई जब हम फिर लाल किले देरी में जाकर वह हमारे विक्ति परेड करेंगे रास्ता की हमें अपना खून बहाना है हमें कुर्बानी उठाना है सब रुकावटें का सामना करना है हाथ में कामयाब करना है इस रास्ते में हम क्या देख हम सब गुलाम है हमारे हाथ में हाथ है क्या हमारे रास्ते में आएगी भूख प्यार तकलीफें बीबते मौत कोई नहीं कह सकता है जिन लोग इस जंग में शरीक होंगे उनसे कैसे लोग निकलेंगे जिंदा होगा कोई बात नहीं है हम जिंदा रहेंगे या तो मरेंगे कोई बात नहीं है बात कोई सही बात यह है अहम बात यह है कि आखिर में हमारी कामयाबी होगी इनो तनाजा होगा दोस्तों इसलिए आखिर में आपसे यह अर्ज नहीं है जान बुझ कर खुले आंखों से खुली आंखों से पूरी मर्जी से पूछना है अगर आप पूछो और जो कुछ कीमत देना है भूख जात जीवत और तकलीफ और मौत सब सामना करके मैं जानता हूं आप में वो ताकत है जान बुझ कर आप खुद पड़ेंगे और हिंदुस्तान को आखिर दे personal command of the Indian National Army on July 25, 1943. The Supreme Command headquarters was established at Rangoon and several brigades were formed 
to build a compact national army capable of spearheading the attack against the British. war in the Far East began disastrously for the British forces. They lost ground rapidly, retreated from position to position, and the victorious Japanese swarmed all over the place. The INA had brigades named after Gandhi and Nehru. If Gandhi Brigade and Nehru Brigade were the names Netaji gave to those INA formations in Burma, it was a spontaneous decision to forge symbolically the bond of unity of India's first national army with the unarmed mass freedom movement led by Mahatma Gandhi, Pandit Nehru and others. Here was the Indian National Army whose approach would raise the final rebellion and mutiny in India. The battle cry would be Chalo Dilhi until the victory parade was held in the red fort of India's ancient capital. General Fajera, mm -hmm. was INA subject to Japanese military law? No. INA was an independent arm of the provincial government of free India. INA had equal status with the Japanese army and were fully it alive. We are told, Netaji told General Kabe that the only flag that will fly over Indian territory yeah. would be the Indian tricolor. Mm. That's right. The tricolor only. We had an agreement that the uh, occupied territories would be immediately transferred to the administrative committee of the occupied territory of the provincial government of the India. According to General Fujiara, after the Japanese occupation of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, control of the territories was transferred to the Azad Hind government under the terms of the agreement. General, would you kindly give me an example that Netaji never had any personal ambition? Yes. The conversation between Netaji and General Tojo at the time of the Greater East Asian Conference in November 1943 was an example. When General Tojo said, you are all in all in free India, Etaji said, no. He said that leader in India would be decided by the Indian people. If they are only person who deserves to be called leaders in India, they are Gandhi, Nehru, and Azad. I say that the control 
in the creation of a new and free Asia may be fully and finally consummated. And let me assure you, Your Excellency, that if you and your distinguished colleagues succeed in this highest mission of mankind, as I hope, I trust, and I believe you will, your names will go down in history, not merely as the makers of a new reform, not merely as the makers of a new East Asia, not merely as the makers of a new Asia, but as the makers and the architects of a new world. Subhash Bose knew and honored every individual member of the INA. He maintained contacts with every individual of the army. He displayed effective leadership by establishing rapport with every one of them. He did not hesitate to honor them on every available occasion. All this endeared him to the army, and they were ready to follow him to a man. But the tide of war was turning in the Far East. The Japanese army was wilting under the determined attacks of the British, who had now been joined by the Americans in the Malayan theater of war. was very clear, reach the homeland at any cost. No sacrifice was great. Thus, Indian soil was dyed red with the blood of the Indian soldiers who fell wherever they charged the enemy. At Moirang Kangla, April 14th, 1944, the Indian tricolor was hoisted by the INA. British and American forces began to gain ground and the beleaguered Japanese began to retreat. In the wake of the terrible war that was fought, arson and loot became common occurrences. Finally, the atom bomb was dropped over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the war came to an end. The Japanese signed the instrument of surrender. In Singapore, Earl Mountbatten declared, As I speak, there are a hundred thousand men ashore. This invasion would have taken place on the 9th of September, whether the Japanese had resisted or not. I wish to make this plain. The surrender today is no negotiated surrender. The Japanese are submitting to superior forces now massed here. And as for the INA, that valiant band of freedom fighters found themselves abandoned and imprisoned. The men of the British Indian Army, by an ironical twist of fate, were given the task of holding these men prisoners. But the fire burned bright in their eyes. They had been ready to fight until not a drop of blood remained in their veins. The defeat of the Japanese had halted them in mid-stride. At the Red Fort in Delhi in 1945, the leaders of the INA, Shanavas, Dillon and Sagal, were charged with treason. Colonel Dillon of the INA spoke on the character of the freedom movement, of which the INA was only a trigger. 
I asked Netaji that as we and our allies appear to have lost the war and there were little hope of our taking to offensive again, what exactly was left for us to fight or what were we fighting for? Without the least sign of annoyance, that came the reply to pay the price of India's liberty. His reply was in line with a previous statement, when the blood of freedom-loving Indians begins to flow, India will attain her freedom. Thus, our national aim was the attainment of Indian freedom, and our military objective was to pay the price of India's liberty. And the man behind it all, that valiant fighter for freedom, that man who gave to his soldiers of the Azad Hind Fauz a common language and a common purpose, that man who banished casteism and provincialism from the INA, that man who hungered for a free India and declared that the roads to Delhi are many and Delhi still remains our goal. That man, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, lives in the hearts of his people like an eternal flame that burns bright. Oh. Uh-huh. 